Good morning, folks. Thank you all for coming today. Before we commence, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here in Brisbane today, the Yugara and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Welcome to this panel discussion on sports diplomacy, Papua New Guinea and the NRL. Now, I know what you're thinking, and you're right. I would have made a terrific prop for the Broncos. <laughs> but apparently they already have one. But in all seriousness, I'm not going to try to convince you that I'm a rugby league expert. I tried that, and it was too hard. And besides, that's what these guys are here for. The other thing is, my friends told me not to bring up the Blues loss last week, so I won't do that because I don't want to be rude, um, apart from just now. And it might come up again later. But I'll tell you what I do know a bit about, and that is the relationship between Papua New Guinea and Australia. At the Lowy Institute, I run a project called the AusPNG Network. Our goal is to bring people from our two countries together in person where possible so that we can understand each other better. It's simple, really, but it's not often easy. And that's why I'm so excited today that we're here to talk about something that is very close to both countries, sport. And for any international policy experts that have accidentally joined this event, relax. It's not really about sport. It's about diplomacy. You're going to love it. For the sports fans, welcome. Don't worry about what I just said. This talk won't be about international relations. <laughs> you didn't come to the wrong room. You see, diplomacy is hollow without people-to-people -people links, and sport is perhaps the greatest such connector between Papua New Guinea and Australia. And rugby league, well, you all know why rugby league is so important, otherwise you wouldn't have joined us today. So thank you. In a minute, we're going to delve into the role of sports, particularly league, in shaping the diplomatic relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea, with a special focus on PNG's bid to join the NRL. And we are privileged to have three esteemed panelists with us today who bring with them a wealth of knowledge and experience in this field. And boy, am I glad they showed up. Thank you. Let me briefly introduce our special guest presenters today. At the far end, we have the Honorable Pat Conroy MP, Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Minister Conroy's role places him at the center of Australia's diplomatic relations with Pacific countries. And his presence here today is an invaluable opportunity to gain insights into the policy dimensions of sports diplomacy. Minister Conroy will be delivering a few marks today before we kick off our panel discussion. Minister, thank you so much for joining us. To my immediate right, we have Amelia Cook. Born in Mount Hagen, Amelia is an accomplished rugby league player and a pioneering figure in women's sport. She has played rugby league for Australia and Papua New Guinea, including at the 2017 World Cup with the Orchids. Amelia played in the Bronco, Broncos women's inaugural side in 2018 and won a premiership. She's played for Queensland and in the state of origin. She's a mum of two, and she's aiming to get back to league next year. Amelia has not only made her mark through exceptional athletic performances, but also as an advocate for inclusivity and the advancement of women in rugby league. Our third panelist is David Mead. Born in Port Moresby, David moved to Australia when he was 12. David played 172 games in the NRL and 58 games in the English Super League before retiring at the end of the 2022 NRL season. An alumnus of the Gold Coast Titans, the Brisbane Broncos, the Catalans Dragons, David has also represented PNG on 15 occasions across three Rugby League World Cups. He's a devoted ambassador for his homeland and has consistently championed Rugby League at the grassroots level in Papua New Guinea. I look forward to hearing our panelists' reflections on Rugby League, the PNG NRL bid, and its potential implications for sports diplomacy between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Thank you all for joining us. Without further ado, let's begin with Minister Conroy's remarks. Uh, Thank you. I'm just going to turn my chair around because I'm sort of facing my back to the audience. Uh, I'm not going to give you a big formal speech, so don't be scared by these notes. <laughs> I just want to sort of start with a couple of introductory remarks. And obviously, I begin by acknowledging the uh, Turrbal and Yugura people and pay my respects to any 
uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present here, especially acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Daddy Toka Jr., Deputy Governor of uh, Port Moresby Province uh, here, as well as I think there's representatives from the PNG Hunters uh, Club here. Uh, I'm vastly underqualified to be on this panel with two great sports stars. And I will point out, it's very rude of Lowy to put me next to David, given he's probably <laughs> the only person to have scored two hat-tricks against my beloved Roosters side, who importantly had the, I think, probably the first uh, sort of prominent uh, Kumul to play in the NRL in Adrian Lamb, um, a, a great play. There might have been ones before him, and I don't mean to disrespect him, but certainly my living memory, he was the first player I associated with Papua New Guinea in rugby league. Um, and he's certainly been a pathfinder, as has David. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And he, he might have helped you win a, a, a state of origin or two as well. Uh, look, uh, sports diplomacy is why we're all here. People understand the power of it. Um, and uh, we'll be concentrating on rugby league, but it's everywhere. Uh, I got to sit down and watch the Super Pacific Women's Rugby Championship the first year I was on with my daughter, who was about to play her first season of rugby union and to watch the Fijiana Drua side win that championship in their first year, to see the joy on their faces. I then travelled to uh, Fiji for the Pacific Islands Forum meeting and the most common question I got from journalists from Fiji is, would Australia continue to support their Pacific rugby teams? That is the power of sports diplomacy. Or uh, I was at a reception for um, the Tongan women's netball team and to see their joy on their faces as they qualified for the, uh, the World Cup is just incredible. Um, obviously, the state of origin itself has a long history in the Pacific. The first state of origin game was played uh, uh, amongst Australian soldiers on Bougainville in 1945. And the Queenslanders claim they won the game, but uh, the sort of result is shrouded in the mists of history. And probably the most recent example of the sort of sports diplomacy and the people-to-people -people connections that are there is uh, when the Central Coast Mariners thrashed um, uh, Melbourne in the A-League Grand Final. And I can say that as a representative of the Central Coast. Uh, it was with Nee Vanuatu player Brian Caltech playing centre-back and Prime Minister Kausa Kal was in the crowd in Parramatta cheering on that great result. They are just examples of the people-to-people -people connections that bring the people of the Pacific together. Um, obviously, David and Amelia are, are ambassadors, not just for Papua New Guinea, but quite frankly, for those connections between Papua New Guinea and Australia. And it starts at the very lowest level with five-year-olds kicking the ball around in a playground, and it goes to the most senior levels. A story I've told many people was last year's Pacific Island Forum Leaders Week was in Suva, uh, at, at the time of the third state of origin game. A game which was beautiful for 78 minutes and then horrible for two. Uh, but the game started at 10 o'clock at night Suva time and Prime Minister Albanese and I invited all the other Pacific leaders to watch the game with us in the hotel bar. We sent supporters kits for both the Blues and the Maroons and it was wonderful to bring, I think almost every Pacific leader came and watched the match even though they had a full conference. Uh, I'm was disappointed to say that most of them wore Maroons jerseys, uh, except for the Secretary General, Henry Puna, who was the ultimate politician in the Pacific, who understood that Prime Minister Albanese was a blue supporter. Uh, but it was great. And watching that game, including explaining um, the, the rugby league rules to a couple of the leaders who represented uh, countries with sort of non-rugby league heritage, think some of the French territories or some of the American uh, sort of compact states uh, just brought leaders together and explained that in all this area, the people to people connections of sports are so powerful. And it's not just about bringing people to people together. It's about um, using sport as a message uh, to get across broader issues around social justice. I was in Papua New Guinea uh, for Anzac Day, and I visited a um, League Belong Life program, which was using rugby league skills and drills to educate people about domestic violence. And to me, that's a great example of that. And I can't think of a greater group of ambassadors than the PNG Orchids for gender equality. Having seen 
that wonderful documentary, having seen them work in their community is just so powerful in Papua New Guinea. So sorry for rambling on, but I'm very enthusiastic about it. And we haven't even talked about having a PNG team in the NRL, but I'm sure that will be the, the main topic of this panel conversation. But thank you, Loie, for putting this on. Thank you, David and Amelia, for being here. And I really look forward to having a great discussion. Thank you, Minister. Um, <clears throat> I should have said, my name is Mihai Sora, by the way, and I work at the Loie Institute. Um, <clears throat> That documentary the minister referred to is Power Mary. We actually have the director of that documentary in the audience with us, uh, Joanna Lester. Joanna, thank you so much for being here and for helping us put uh, today together. Um, <clears throat> minister, uh, we'll kick off the, the grilling very soon. Uh, I mean, the friendly chat. Um, <laughs> for the audience, I'll throw a few questions to each panelist to get us started. But I want you to think about your own questions because we will have an opportunity for audience Q&A. And if you're sitting there thinking that's not the right question or that answer wasn't complete, I invite you to, to jump in when we get into the Q&A. And that will be followed by sandwiches. Now remember those later when you're hungry because they'll be waiting outside. But first, you have to earn it. So for my first question, Minister, uh, I'll throw it to you, um, and it would be great if you could expand on particularly the Australia-Papua New Guinea relationship. What more can we do with sports diplomacy? Do you see potential for growth in Australia's engagement in that space? And, and what is the PNG side also bringing to that partnership? Uh, I think there's huge opportunities. Uh, not enough people realise that Papua New Guinea is our closest neighbour. Um, I've seen polls where people have asked people what name Australia's closest neighbour and people list Indonesia, people list Timor-Leste and when you say the closest point of Papua New Guinea to Australia is four kilometres, the, the fact that you could swim between the two countries if you weren't worried about saltwater cro crocodiles, and you should be, um, um, I think just demonstrates the closeness of our relationship and the potential. Uh, and I think sport and particularly rugby league, has a powerful part of that. Um, uh, I'm unofficially known within the Australian government as the Minister for Rugby League, uh, and it's a great title. And to, to travel to Papua New Guinea with Prime Minister Albanese at the start of this year for when uh, the Prime Minister was the first foreign leader to address the Papua New Guinea Parliament, and the loudest cheer, the loudest applause he got in that August uh, hall was when he said that the Australian government uh, is very keen to see a PNG team in the Australian Rugby League competition into the NRL. Um, and that's because it is the national sport of Papua New Guinea, uh, as it is the, the sport of New South Wales and Queensland, the two most important states in Australia. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm very proud to say that on the public record. Uh, uh, this will only bring our people closer to closer together. And that's why the Australian government is very keen to explore opportunities for how we can support it. The Pacific Oz Sports Program has about $18 million worth of funding. And we already provide significant funding to Rugby League, uh, both uh, for things like the PNG Hunters to be in the Queensland Cup uh, for the annual Prime Minister's 13 game. Um, and we just announced uh, at the start of the year annual schoolboys and schoolgirls tours of each country. And this is all to grow the elite pipeline so that a PNG and NRL side is practical and most importantly, competitive in the NRL going forward. And that, and obviously our support is for both a male and female teams. Like we, we think that it's critical that uh, men and women are on this journey together. Fantastic. Okay, let's hear from a couple of men and women. Um, Amelia, as a pioneering woman, in rugby league, how do you view the status of women's rugby league in Papua New Guinea? And what do you believe is its potential going forward? Yeah, good question. I think the potential for women's rugby league in general, like we have the talent there to be the best in the world. And I'm not like just saying that because I'm from Papua New Guinea. Um, like the raw talent and the passion that we have, you can't coach that, you can't teach that. Um, but talent only gets you so far, you know, you need the resources and the hard work behind it to drive that and push that forward um, to get to to a place where we want to we want to head to. And at the moment, I know um, 
the talent comes only from Port Moresby base. Like we've got a lot of LC Alberts that are, you know, in the Highlands, from the Highlands to the Highlands and, and they're everywhere and they're just waiting for an opportunity to be seen, to, to, give, to give that opportunity to go and play. Um, and I think the standard that we have at the moment, the development pathways, like we've still got a long way to go. Um, and it's really awesome to hear you say that the, you're looking to put a woman's team beside a men's team as well. I think that's so important going forward um, and to have those development pathways in place so that we've got the skill level that's starting from, you know, under fives, under sixes at school coming through to high school. And then when they finish school to go to the normal club level um, and that'll just make the decision for the coach is a lot easier to pick from as well. They've got a, a big pool in PNG to to pick from at the moment. They're looking outside, um, you know, Brisbane-based, overseas-based PNG players to come in to make the PNG Orchids team. But we've got our actual local talent back home, and it'd be awesome to see it, um, you know, blossom and come into light in the future heading forward. Yeah, awesome. Um, question for you, David. Hope you're ready. How has your Papua New Guinea heritage influenced your professional career in Australia? Uh, yes, uh, morning everyone. Um, I guess, yeah, I was thinking of that question when you sent it through. Probably just for a bit of context, I guess, how I was influenced early. Um, so I was born in Port Moresby, I know you mentioned that before, but half an hour out of there is a Tubusera village. Went to school in the village, um, lived a simple life, single mother, you know, cousins, uncles, aunties everywhere, grandparents. I uh, spent a lot of time with my grandparents growing up and I saw how hard they worked and, you know, they, they, they worked hard to support their family. But then, you know, in school, when, when we did go to school, it was, you know, you, you're taught as a kid to you know, study hard, um, you know, behave, all these things. But then also the stuff that you do voluntarily as a kid is, is sport. And, and number one is rugby league. You know. uh, as a kid growing up in the village, you don't always have a rugby league ball, but you know you, you find what you can. It's an empty plastic bottle, empty Coke bottle. You pick that up and you kick it around. So, and when we talk about how powerful sport is and the influence that you know, how I was influenced uh, growing up, that was the foundation of it. But then I also watched you know NRL on the weekends. I was a St George Dragons fan um, growing up, but that's changed over time because of <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, because of my career. Still, still, still a soft spot for them, but two other clubs have taken that priority. Um, but in saying that Broncos had a, you know, big, uh, you know, I was a, you know, growing up in the 90s as well, so they had that good era of, uh, you know, winning and they you know, got some solid support from PNG. So I was either Nathan Blacklock or Steve Renoff as a kid playing in the village. And so I guess that's how it, the influence uh, of rugby league uh, or the impact that you know, rugby league had on me as a kid growing up. And then when I got an opportunity to come to Australia as a 12 year old, um, and my auntie adopted me and then it was for educational purposes, but I knew I wanted to play rugby league at the highest level. And so, you know, I went to school in Lismore, New South Wales. Um, I did support New South Wales Good. in PNG. Good. Yeah, my grandfather was a New South Wales fan. Uh, the other 95% of our family weren't. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, getting an opportunity in Lismore coming through uh, you know, the ranks there, you know, that you just notice so much difference in, you know, just rugby league competitions uh, on the weekends. Uh, I did play rugby union for a couple of years because my two older brothers did, but the year that I did change, Gold Coast Titans had come into the competition in 2007, I think it was. And I, don't, I think if they don't come into the Gold Coast and have that Northern New South Wales as their catchment area, I probably don't get an opportunity. And so I think, you know, when you get a, when we talk about PNG and our old bid, and uh, I'm, sure I'm probably skipping a few steps no. here, uh, but that, that's what that's what rugby league does, you know, especially in you know, um, you know certain areas. It, it just opens up a whole window of opportunity for kids who want to play at the highest level. But I'll leave that uh, at that for now. Uh, I won't skip skip any more questions. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how rugby league has influenced me to uh, get to where I am. Yeah, beautiful. You can see that passion here today as well, Minister. Back to you now. Um, if the PNG NRL bid is successful, how do you see this impacting community ties between Australia and Papua New Guinea? Uh, well, I'd love it. I'd love to see not just that encouragement of healthy lifestyles and another pathway for mobility for Papua New Guinean uh, kids, but also to grow tourism. I'm a big fan of sports tourism. Um, I came up to Brisbane for the Magic Round 
um, and watched three days of Festival of Rugby League, which was awesome. Um, and I've been to the Auckland Nines a couple of times um, to watch um, that. And so if we get this right, we'll see Australians travelling to Moresby to watch their team play the, the PNG team, injecting money into the local economy, deepening the links. Because when, when you're naturally in a country, as much as you want to watch sport the whole time, sport is not on the whole time. So you'll have a look around. They'll see, they'll start exploring the beautiful parts of Papua New Guinea because I think another area where we're really keen to work more closely with the Papua New Guinean government is around tourism. Uh, I think PNG is such a beautiful country and except for limited pathways, like if you're a surfer, the, the northern part of PNG is, uh, I was talking to Wayne Swan a month ago and he'd just come back from surfing on the north coast of PNG. Um, and obviously there's the Kokoda heritage and walking the Kokoda track, but we need more tourism and sports tourism can be part of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll, we might touch on that a bit later as well. A question for you, Amelia. Was your experience playing in Papua New Guinea different from playing in Australia? Just talk us through, you know, what's what's the vibe like? What what are the the cultural and and sort of emotional and and practical differences between the two uh, countries? Yeah, so I didn't actually um, play like grow up playing in in Port Moresby or in Papua New Guinea, but um, having played for both countries and seeing the different um, system and the way it's set up um, really opened my eyes actually because like coming into the Australian system um, just the professionalism and how the girls are treated and you walk in and you don't have to worry about anything like you just worry about your job you go into training and you have a game to play and everyone else there's like so many different staff and they all each have a really important role to play and contribute towards the team um, and then compare that to you know going to the PNG system and coming through that um, yeah, it's it's very different from the hotels, the stuff that we, the place that we stay at, to like the meals that we eat, the recovery, um, the amount of staff we have around in terms of you know physio and the access that we have as well. Um, it, it's you know I guess you know Australia has like 30, 40 years of girls that have sacrificed and gone before and paved the pathway, whereas we're just getting started. You know the orchids was just born only a, less than five years ago, um, and they're they're up and coming and the girls that are playing now are the pioneers. They are the, um, you know, I'll use the big names here, like the Karen Murphys, you know, the, the girls that are playing now, they are the ones that are, are paving the pathway for the future generation to come. And just seeing the the comparison, like we've got a long way to go for Papua New Guinea, um, the, the girls in general, and that's not just in rugby league, like that's every sport. Um, I was lucky enough to play sevens as well and just seeing how, um, it's set up, you know, my first ever sevens camp, we were put in Bobana prison, like the inmates were serving us breakfast. Like that's how <laughs> you were not allowed to make eye contact with them. Like that's, that's how it was growing up and, and playing for Papua New Guinea. So when I went back and played rugby league, I expected the same. Like we, we had a Fijian coach for seven to, um, would come in the morning at 5am and she'd like blow the whistle, wake us up. You do laps around the overall like it was last man standing and I didn't really understand the purpose of that training because I'm like we're playing sevens but we're here running until the last person drops like I didn't get the point of that and I think um, just having the right resources and the facilities and the training equipment and stuff and, and just having that education and knowledge in the background um, is, is so important so I think in comparison, back to your question, sorry, I'm getting a little off track here, but um, compared to Australian PNG, like we've still got a while to go, but I think we're definitely on the right track. Um, I know the QRL is working closely with PNG as well, getting some systems in place. Um, I know Cassie, she's in the background today and she's doing a lot of good work as well. So seeing that and, and having them on board, I think is, is pushing for a better, um, better future. And yeah, I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I think people, at least on the Australian side, often underestimate, you know, we, there is an identifiable connection and passion and a universality in our region around rugby league. But I think sometimes, you know, those sort of stories, they, they show us that there are also differences that, that we need to manage. And I think now is, is a, good, a good time to pivot. David, a, a question for you, you know, as a player with experience both in the NRL and Super League, but thinking about a PNG-based NRL team, what are the, the challenges? What are the opportunities? Talk us through the, the practicalities. Yeah, well, I think the opportunities are endless. I think, you know, 
coming here, I was going to talk about rugby league through the lens of a former player. But I think now that I'm working at the Broncos, uh, I've seen what the the community team does. It's a massive team there. There's 80, 80 full-time staff who go out in the community, serve, you know, doing you know thousands and thousands of hours of work in the community. Like as you know, as uh, Mr. Pat Conroy said, it's not just the, about the game itself, but it's the community programs that it opens up the opportunities to. And then also there's a game development side of it, you know, the, driving the participation um, and using sport as a tool to increase the participation uh, rate in, in schools. I mean, we know that sport's a powerful tool and, and it certainly helps that. Uh, again, I'll keep mentioning Broncos because that's, you know, that's, that's where my education is coming from. I think if an NRL bid team was successful uh, in PNG or you know, for PNG, those are the types of opportunities that it creates. And I can't name them all because it's endless, but, and then, and then you come to the actual rugby league team. You know, I've got probably two different perspectives on this. I'm, I'm biased, I want PNG to be uh, in the NRL, but then I'm also thinking, how do we feed that team moving forward? Now, Redcliffe Dolphins coming into the competition made a lot of sense because there's, they've been around for a long time, got a pretty good junior system in place there. I guess my concern was probably how do we create the pathways programs in PNG so that that team is uh, sustainable long term? And I guess with uh, you know that challenge, opportunities uh, arise, and you know we can we can address that and and do something about it. You know, prior to the team being announced and brought into the competition. So I do want the team to be involved. I'm, I'm, I hope PNG is next in the NRL. I know that uh, Peter Vlandis has a very strong opinion about uh, PNG. Uh, getting involved, he, he, he wants to. Um, I think my concern, like probably most other PNG Kumuls teammates and, and a lot of people in, involved directly with rugby league, uh, I think I, I'd probably share that same view with them as well. So I think that's a challenge that we'll have to address uh, moving forward. But, you know, it, it's positive, I think, um, and exciting as well. So yeah, I think that's my view on that. And if I could just jump in there on, the, on that last point, it's, it's a point that both the NRL and the Australian government and the PNG government are really focused on is that player pathway and getting that culture of excellence because we need that pipeline and that's why the first steps, the PNG Hunters coming in, the, um, the PM's 13 games. Uh, now the school boys and school girls tours are all instrumental key steps along the pathway because... Um, let's be frank about it. Most of the PNG players that are playing at the highest level in Australia have normally moved to Australia. David's example, when he was 12, Adrian Lamb, nine. Um, Justin Olam is one of the rare exceptions that came across to Australia, a bit, was identified a bit later. We need to have a system in place. So great young Papua New Guinean players are playing at home and then they're getting picked up. They're being identified and there's an elite pathway, the centres of excellence in Papua New Guinea that they come through. And that's critical to the sustainability of any bid. Yeah, I'll probably just touch on that as well. Now that I'm at the Broncos, I understand how the pathway system worked. As a player, you see the 14, under 14s uh, academy come through you know, once or twice a year. Uh, but speaking to the trainers there, they're saying that these 14 year olds, they're coming in 15 to 20 times a year. They're getting the education about, you know, what to eat, how to train, how to sleep, you know, hydration, Anything you think about, you're, you're getting all that information at 14. You know, and that's that's why the, the club's um, been doing well for such a long time. And, the, you know, uh, Paul Dyer, who's um, been there for a long time, he said that that's, that's a model that works. Uh, that's a model that I love to see being implemented in PNG because you know, the, the amount of kids that come through and are able to perform at the highest level um, at a very early age, you know, we see Ezra Mann, Payne Haas, uh, Selwyn Cobo, they're debuting at 18, 19. Um, people watching them thinking, man, these guys must be so talented. Well, they are talented, but they've also trained for five years. You know, so at that highest level, uh, if, you don't, if you don't get that coaching early, uh, you get it at 23, 24. And by the time you're ready to play, you're, you're 28 years old and you're back into your career. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very important you know, um, system to have in place. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad you touched on that because, yeah, it, I think if a PNG NRL bid team was to come in you know, within the, I mean, the 
I saw some quotes from, from Peter Vlandis, um, you know, as, as early as 2027 20, to 2030. It's pretty early, it's pretty quickly. So I think we're going to need to get some uh, kids lined up. And, and there's a big lineup of them too. You know, mm-hmm. I, I went to um, uh, Daddy's uh, place actually, uh, uh, Corner Double, the field there. Yeah. I just popped in, did a few drills with the kids. You know, some of them were struggling to catch a footy. Uh, did a 10 minute drill with them. They're just catching it, you know, you know, 10 minutes later with good, with good technique. So, and that's only 10 minute session. So I'm excited because the opportunity that it'll open up for the country for, you know, uh, you know, staff from here to travel to educate Papua New Guineans over there. That's what it's going to do for the whole country across the country. And I've seen kids, you know, they want direction. They want they want um, role models in the community. And there's a big big um, there's a huge uh, youth crime problem over there. Rugby league or sport in general is a very good tool to make changes in in that area because they're 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 around you know these the settlement areas where the rascals are around and you know the rascals they don't want these kids kids getting involved. They they actually tell them don't follow what we do, but we all know that you know advice isn't followed it's you know it's we do what we see and so you know, i think these programs in place massive win for png can i add to that as well Please. um i think just speaking from the woman's perspective now like the boys already have the hunter system they've got the digital cup like that's a some sort of pathway that's coming through but the women have got nothing um at the moment so moving forward if the talk is to put another women's nrl like a png nrl team into that how do we just, you know, out of the blue, start up a competition straight away and get the girls going to play? Because at the moment, they're just, the Palm Bay players have got their own nationals where they play different zones and stuff. So they've got some sort of pathway there. But if we're extending that invitation out to all of Papua New Guinea and trying to get the girls involved, um, there's no actual pathway. Um, you go from, you know, playing your club to getting seen and then you play for the Orchids. But if we're if this competition was to survive and and you know i'm grateful that they're including the women's team and trying to talk about that as well for for it to last and and to go forward like do we just is it a png based team do we bring in you know talk about bringing a top tier player from um the girls that are playing at the moment sorry nrlw to bring them in like what are the talks behind what you're selling them like are they coming into the team with their families and stuff like money wise everything like there's so much discussion and there's so much behind the scenes that needs to happen so i guess in terms of the time frame and when we're willing to happen like i know you mentioned 2027 and happening really soon um like from the woman's point of view and and that game and where it's going um i think we're like realistically speaking so far behind Mm -hmm. so how do we compete with the men and get them on the same page kind of thing yeah, thank you for that. And I was actually coming to you and, and just to touch on that exactly. So with this possibility that, uh, that an NRL women's team would be stood up as, as part of that, um, the PNG bid, you know, what would it mean for women's sport in Papua New Guinea? But also what needs to happen? You know, I think you have touched on, on this a little bit, but, but what do you think needs to happen? How would, how would it look like for you if, if you could control all of the steps? What's the sequence? What needs to happen to make more opportunities available for Papua New Guinean women wanting a footy career? Yeah, I think it's similar to what David was talking about. You know, you can't be what you can't see. So the players that have, are playing now in the NRLW, you know, Elsie Albert is like our Justin alum for the women's game. Like she's a rare breed that's come straight from Papua New Guinea and has made it. And um, like it's awesome to see her achieve so much in the short time that she has played. Uh, but in terms of the program set up, I think it'd be awesome to see another like Digicel Cup type, you know, competition for women. Um, that would be a clear pathway where the girls playing in the grassroots can and see and aspire to be like, because they know that from there they can go into uh, the Orchids or go a step into the NRLW. And if there's a PNG team in the NRLW, then like perfect. Like you can actually clearly see a pathway and you're, you're training for a reason and, and a goal and working towards something rather than, you know, you just train here and there and you play on the weekend and um, with no real intention to go anywhere so I think a lot of it we've covered with development players like I love what you said about the under 14s as well like I think something like that for the women's but you know bringing into school because I think that's where um, adding into the future a lot of the kids that are in school like teaching the programs in school coming up into like club rugby and then heading into like the national stage 
would probably be like the better pathway to go. And what do you think the impact would be on the status of women's sport in Papua New Guinea or women socially in Papua New Guinea? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you touched before as well, Pat, the using sport, but rugby league as a vehicle to drive that change. And we've seen it, I've seen it firsthand over the years. Um, and for those who've watched the documentary, you would have seen um, some of the girls talk about bottles being thrown at them when they were playing rugby league, um, which only happened a couple of years ago. But now, after recently from the World Cup as well, winning a couple of games, um, but, but winning by heaps as well, and, and seeing how well the girls have played and how far they've come, I think that has um, definitely opened the eyes of Papua New Guineans everywhere. And we're getting people on board now, getting them to support us, um, supporting women playing footy and, and seeing that the, um, you know, Elsie as well, I like to use her as an example, but her making it as well, they're like, oh, you can actually go play NRLW, get paid, live in Australia. Uh, but you know just here to play you know there's other opportunities you can study if you want to um it's just a way out i think you know coming from from papua new guinea you're not just coming to play rugby league here if you crack it you're also there's so many opportunities here to to make a career if you wanted to go down the studying pathway or working and getting experience there as well so um it's important to start young as well you know like david mentioned before you don't want to be starting at 21 23 and then by the time you're ready to play you know, if a men's career ends at like 28, you had like a female in there and they've got kids and everything else and that just like a, a another um, issue in itself. So the short amount of time that you are performing at your peak level, you wanna be able to do it with the best facilities available and given the best opportunity to do that. Yeah, absolutely. David, question for you. So you've touched on this as well a little bit, but what role do you see for yourself and other successful players in promoting and or supporting a PNG NRL bid? Uh, yeah, yeah, besides voicing my opinion and yeah. talking to a few newspapers here and there about promoting <laughs> the game. You know, I think part of my role at the Broncos again, my apologies, I'll keep bringing it up, um, keep giving the Broncos a plug over all the other NRL teams. It's about, um, you know, when I, the day one when I first walked into the club, they showed me the top 10 cities that uh, in the world that followed the Broncos. Number two was Port Moresby, uh, behind Brisbane, obviously. And in at eight was Leigh. And so there's obviously a lot of uh, eyeballs that support the Broncos, uh, a lot of interest for the club. And I'm sure those numbers dramatically rise when you put the whole NRL together. I was a former player and I know what it's, what it's like to come through the system here in Australia. I, I understand that you know, what Minister Conroy said before, it's about getting players into the NRL systems earlier. The opportunity for the players in PNG is nowhere near, or is pretty much non-existent. I mean, we've got the Hunters, Digital Cup, but even those, these guys are waiting till they're you know, early to mid-20s. And by that stage, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a bit too late. My support for PNG is going to be first and foremost through the junior development pathway system, which, uh, you know, which I'm working uh, with the Broncos on to implement there. So that's my focus uh, is about, you know, helping the juniors to, you know, not just be good rugby league players or, you know, because uh, let's be honest, it's only going to be a very small percentage that um, get that opportunity. I think the more important part is, you know, education, you know, living, you know, healthy lifestyles, you know, being a good uh, person in the community, contributing to your household, you know, making sure that you know your community is safe, all, all these things. I think that's probably more more of my concern than the actual NRL team in itself, um, based in PNG. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's really important, um, Minister. Question for you: Stepping up a little bit in terms of broader international mm. policy. How would Papua New Guinea's inclusion in the NRL, um, how significant would that be for the political relationship? Um, and perhaps if you could step out even further, you know, with the Olympics and other sporting mm. competitions coming to coming up in Queensland, we've got the Pacific Games in mm. Solomon Islands. Um, we have a lot of success, as, as you touched on in your opening remarks, of Pacific sporting teams mm. in other codes, uh, particularly women's teams. What does this mean for the Pacific on the world stage being cast in a positive light? Mm. Um, you know, not a focus on the geopolitics, mm. but but that is a part of the region today. Mm. 
how does sport connect with these global forces and, and what is Australia's role in supporting this mm. positive attention? Well, there's a fair, fair whack in that question. Yeah. Um, uh, That's why you get the big bucks. Uh, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, I think people-to-people -people connections are so important uh, for our region. Like, I think the more we can understand each other and the more we can relate to each other generates a safer and stable and prosperous region. And that's really important. And there are many strands to that. Having Pacific Islanders working in the Australian economy is a great example of that. We've got 38,000 um, Pacific Islanders working in um, uh, through the Pacific Labor Schemes. I met the first cohort of uh, Papua New Guinea nurses uh, up in Moresby and they've already come into Australia in Queensland working in our aged care system. Th that's one example. Um, for a lot of people, it's a shared Christian faith that is really, really important that unites our region. Sport's another one. Like I'm so proud that around 50% of NRL players are of Pacifica heritage. It, and that's something that's tremendous and we should embrace that. Uh, I was in Samoa uh, in February or March, I think it was February, and I was having dinner with about a third of the Samoan cabinet. And for the first hour and a half of the dinner, we were just talking about sport, principally rugby league and rugby union that obviously come off their great achievement in the World Cup where they thrashed uh, England. And I, I, quite frankly, I said to them, if, if all the uh, Kangaroos players of Samoan heritage played for Samoa instead of Australia, they would have won that final. Um, and we just announced that we we're sponsoring Manu Samoa, so the Samoan Rugby Union team. Um, we were the uh, Pacific Oz Sports um, it, is the, uh, the key jersey sponsor for them in the Rugby World Cup coming up. So it brings our region together. And the more we come together and talk to each other, the more we can relate to each other. And so that's why it's so important on the world stage and within our region and taking the heat out of some of the sort of frictions that are going on at the moment. And globally, like, um, I never want to see our region reduced to just being good at sport, whether it's Pacific Islanders or even Australia known for being good at cricket or rugby league and rugby union. Like, that is part of who we are and that's what we embrace, but that's not what we are as nations and as a region. But obviously it's a good entry point into starting to talk about people. Like I'll give you another example that Samoan, when um, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, gave the Samoan Rugby League team a call out um, and best of luck before the World Cup, like his global reach is unprecedented. Like he's a global megastar. And for a lot of people, that's their first knowledge of Samoa. And that can only be a good thing. So I think that's the power of sport. And then the positive message, it's like I talked about the domestic violence angle with the um, league program. Another one, I was talking to a Telstra Digicel executive uh, at the PMs 13, and they're now the sponsor, key jersey sponsor for the Kummels and the Orchids. They said one of their conditions for coming on board was that the Kummels and the Orchid players are paid exactly the same amount in terms of match payments. There, I would love that to be the case in Australia. I can't think of any other sporting code in the world where the male and female national players are paid the same in terms of match payments. And that was their goal through Digicel's intervention and sponsorship. That is awesome. And that's the power of sport to be a positive role model. Yeah, thank you. That was a great attempt at uh, unpicking that jumble that I threw at you. <laughs> Folks, that was the last question from me, but I would love to throw it to the audience. Um, we have about 15 minutes uh, for, for questions and answers. Minister Conroy has to depart at about 20 past 12. He's got a flight to catch. We are so uh, grateful that he was able to join us. And some of you would have seen we've adjusted the time. That's to incorporate this. So let's make the most uh, of the next 15 or so minutes. Um, and when you ask your question, I think we've got a roving mic on standby, he's poised, um, possible future athlete. Um, <laughs> if you could uh, identify yourself by name and any relevant affiliation, just to um, give us a sense of your perspective. Um, the floor is open. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, sorry. Is that what? Mm. which is going north. Thank you. Joanne Kenny, I'm from that generation that grew up in Papua New Guinea. So Papua New Guinea and country, you know me, and it's top law, hard in the head, you know me. Oh. But 
uh, obviously my parents gave me my Australian skin and I understand both sides of the story. Question is, PNG independence is coming up, 50 years, 2025. Can we have some rugby games, please? Mm. To, to help kind of bring that relationship back into focus, but also perhaps cement that relationship. Just thinking. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, my production company, we did the rugby league commercials, Simply the Best with Tina Turner back there. Mm -hmm. And the reason was to bring women into the game, not only as an audience, but to get the public more involved. So just remember music and rugby league mix so maybe we might think about that too. Um, any, any reactions from the panel maybe, on that one? Maybe, Daddy, will, you might be able to answer that one. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, future panel. <laughs> there was a question well, over I'd, here. I'd, I'll, I'll just yeah. say we, we are very focused on the 50th anniversary of Papua New Guinea independence. Uh, Papua New Guinea is one of the few countries that was formerly a colony of Australia. And those binds, they obviously cut both ways in terms of acknowledging the colonial legacy. But it's really important that uh, we celebrate the independence, particularly from the party of Gough Whitlam. Um, uh, and we're very focused on how we can really demonstrate our love and affection for the people of Papua New Guinea all the time, but especially in 2025. Please. Oh, uh, sorry. Yep. sorry. Did, after the question, okay, please. Hi, I'm Annalisa Mopio J. For those who don't know me, I'm a speaker, counsellor, and Olympian. My question is for David and Amelia. What do you want to see, um, you know, for future PNG NRL players coming through um, grassroots and through to the elite and retirement? What do you want to see in terms of mental health support for those athletes? Mm -hmm. Go first. Um, yeah, awesome question. Um, and it's a tough one as well. I think growing up in the islands, um, mental health is not spoken of. Like, and if you're going through something, you just tough it out, you know, do what you gotta do and move on. Um, and we're seeing a lot more awareness about mental health and mental agility, especially here in Australia, um, but not so much in Papua New Guinea, because, you know, if you're, if you're feeling down, or if you're going through something, they're like, you know, what are you doing? get up and go to work and do something like there's there's actually no talk about it well there's no awareness at all um but with the athletes coming through i think when they're exposed to the the environment and and sort of what we're exposed to here and if especially if there's a png nrl team i'm sure there'll be a counselor on board there'll be a well-being officer like all of that involved as well um slowly opening their mindset so it's okay to talk about things you know if you're going through something especially when you're injured or if you don't make a team I know those things are really important especially um like coming through the system in Australia as well and and when you oh, when you're a woman as well I mean it throws a whole lot of um hardships along the way as well because there's no help there at the moment you know if you're injured you're just sort of left to the side you've forgotten about um similar to when you're retired like you know if you're a big name last year once you retire like who are you and that plays a a mental game with with a lot of athletes that are transitioning out of that um elite phase so you know you're used to everyone doing everything for you you're walking in things are set up this is how the day is going to one day you retire and you're like okay like how is my day going to look now do i have a backup plan have i got a job aligned once i finish my football career like what are my my plans now and I think that's so important as well. And I, I touched base before, you know, rugby league provides that opportunity to go and play and play at that elite level and make a career out of it. But you need to have a backup plan. Like, what are you doing? Are you studying? Are you working? What happens when you get injured? Like, do you have something to fall back on? Having a good support system as well. So I think moving forward, um, that's definitely uh, the way to go as well, is having someone there to, to guide the athletes through and, um, and just making it okay to, I think, talk about it. Because, you know, as we know, Papua New Guineans, like, and then that's like all islanders as well. Like, we don't like to talk about our feelings. We just, you know, get it done and, and move forward. But that's, um, that's a really good, good question and good point. And I think moving forward, that's something that definitely needs to be spoken about. Thank you very much. We had a, a deputy governor wanted to say something. And then Tess, if you wanted to. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, uh, Daddy Toka here. So I won't stand up because I'll have my back towards it. Uh, the rest of the audience. So, so my question will be for Minister departs. Um, uh, I guess it 
it's wonderful to, to hear uh, your remarks, Minister, and David's uh, input, and Amelia. Um, it, it's, um, you know, that, that's, that, that's what we want to hear about the parts moving forward. So my concern is this, I, uh, everything we talk about here has to have a price tag on it. Mm. So I'd now like to pose a question on funding. Mm. Um, Because we we can plan as much as Mm. we want, but um, if the PNG government, with the assistance of the Australian government Mm. and the private sector, cannot um, um, cannot assist, you know, Mm. the the plans we're putting in Mm. place with the relevant funding, then this can all fall through, Mm. and it's happened too many times in the past. Mm. So I guess just a quick question Mm. to to Minister. So is um, so I'm assuming the Australian government is looking at um, uh, putting some sort of a budget behind mm. this bid? Would, would I be correct in saying that? <laughs> um, th- that is literally the, uh, I'll say the $64,000 question rather than the $64 million question. Uh, it is, look, we're, 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 uh, we're in regular discussions both with the PNG government and the NRL and the PNG NRL bid team. Um, they've got to go through their internal processes and the NRL really have to work out how they want to run this whole process because there's at least three or four consortia have expressed interest in this, whether it's um, obviously PNG, you've got North Sydney Bears, you've got a WA team, you've got another Queensland team, I think there's another New Zealand team that's floated interest. There's lots of people interested in the NRL have to work out how they run it, but we certainly, from a federal government point of view, recognise that I can't think of a single thing that we could do to bring the people of the two countries together. So there is a huge diplomatic benefit and a nation-building benefit from this initiative. And so we are thinking and talking about how we could support it. Um, we're not there yet, but we recognise that. Um, I'd make the point, and I know we've got representatives from the resources sector here as well as others, um, I think I can't think of a single team that should get stronger corporate backing outside of the Broncos in terms of dominating entire state <laughs> than a PNG Kummel's time. Like I want, quite frankly, every single resource company in PNG in a fight to the death to who gets to be the jersey sponsor for this team. And I'm thinking in terms of sponsor, um, social license, supporting the PNG, both men's and women's teams in the rugby league comp is a no-brainer. So we recognise that the Australian government will have a role supporting. As I said, we've already got the um, $18 million of annual funding for the All Sports program, including I think it's about um, $6 million for Rugby League already, uh, and most of that either goes to the NRL or QRL for the Hunters. We recognise that um, we may need to step up, but we're not at that stage yet. But you're absolutely right, Daddy. For this to work, we need this to be done through both the NRL and the PNG NRL consortium and government to government. Yeah. Okay, so so I guess the second part of my question is that I've got a few lined up. Uh, yeah. the, will, will this, obviously it, it'll be part of the, uh, let's say the aid budget. Am I right in saying Well, that? no. Well, 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 I guess well, where I'm heading towards, will this affect the current aid that Papua New Guinea gets? Uh, we, we haven't made any formal decisions. I, I make the point that if we provide assistance and be very clear about this no decision has been made most of it will not be eligible will not be counted as eight so elements can so elements so i'll just give you an example already the pacific of sports program 18 million dollars a year there's an oda element so a foreign aid element and that's like the team up program we, we we've got which promotes healthy lifestyles for kids in school basically Play sport is a way about learning about diet and healthy lifestyle. Most of that money does not come out of the aid budget. So of that 18 million, I think it's 14 or 15 million dollars. And I'm looking for representatives to correct me if I'm wrong. Yep, I've got a thumbs up. So about 15 million of that 18 million is not aid. That's money we pay on top of aid because supporting elite pathways, funding the NR the um, hunters into the Australian comp is not aid. So what we're looking at is not part of our aid budget, if we look at anything. Yeah, okay. No, that, that yeah. was just my concern. Yeah. That, uh, no, I, we, did, um, yeah. we are really proud to be the, the biggest development partner of Papua New Guinea. We're privileged and proud to spend 
uh, invest rather around $600 million Australian each year in the future development outcomes of the people of PG, and that won't change with this. Okay, okay so no. sticking to the agenda of bu budgets. Um, now, uh, with respect, Deputy Governor, <laughs> we do have a question on the other side of the room. <laughs> All right. We'll get you a stool. <laughs> you grab me before you go there. This is the danger of giving a politician a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Tess Newton Kane. I'm the project lead for the Griffith Pacific Hub at Griffith University. Um, so, just Minister, you touched on the development agenda for Papua New Guinea, and as we know, Papua New Guinea is a, um, a big country in the region that is is managing a whole range of issues across all sectors. So. Given, given that um, I am a huge supporter of sports diplomacy in the region and go, go our Nivanuatu football players, um, I'm just concerned about the downside risk of the NRL relationship and the fact that when you take NRL teams and the NRL culture into a country like Papua New Guinea, it comes associated with sponsorship by online betting companies which is insidious to the point of being nightmarish it comes with sponsorship by alcohol companies 4x and 2e who both sponsored the uh, state of origin last week it comes with on and off field issues relating to racism on and off field issues relating to uh, violence particularly gender-based violence how, uh, and then to introduce that or to ex introduce that even more so into a country like Papua New Guinea, what, what are the downside risks and how can they best be managed? And I'm going to take a leaf out of the Deputy Governor's book and ask a sub supplementary question. You mentioned tourism. Uh, I note that your vision of tourism was very much one way. So it was Australians going to Moresby to watch football games in Moresby. How are Papua New Guineans going to come and support their team when they're playing the Broncos or the Roosters or whoever, given the issues that are associated with getting visas in order for them to do that? Um, well, thank you, Tess. And on that second question, um, I, I can say that we've made significant investment in um, resolving those visa issues. One of the announcements out of the $1.9 billion Pacific package we announced in the May budget was to establish a, a visa office in Port Moresby uh, because this is a, a issue that gets raised with us a lot by uh, PNG leaders. And it, it's only through the direct um, sort of interventions of Prime Minister Marape and the Deputy Prime Minister and the Cabinet uh, that we've made that investment. We know we need to um, improve visa processing times and that's why that visa processing <laughs> office um, will be established out of the budget and we want to see Papua New Guineans visiting this country um, and we want to make it easier. Uh, my point about the tourism is I want Australians spending money in PNG. Like I, that's just important. Like I, uh, the, one of the objectives of the Marape government is to diversify their economy, is to have ownership of their resources and then diversify their economy. We support that. That's a great thing for PNG. It's great, great for every country, but particularly uh, with the challenges of PNG. Or, on your earlier question, Tess, um, I'll make a couple of points. Um, I think every, well, not every sport, but I'm yet to see a professional sport that doesn't have sponsorship from um, betting agencies. So this is a whole society challenge that we all have to face. And there's a parliamentary inquiry going on right now into advertising around online betting. Um, same with alcohol. Alcohol's legal and if they want to sponsor sports. Um, yes, there's elements of antisocial behaviour that you see in any sport. Um, I think um, rugby league has prominence because these people are celebrities. But what I can say to you is that um, just we've got two ambassadors up here, not just for rugby league, not just for Papua New Guinea, but for respectful relationships. And that documentary was so powerful. And what Amelia was talking about using um, rugby league as a as a vehicle to combat gender equality in PNG is something that's also happening in Australia. Like I think the rise of the NRL women's competition here has been great because it's about um, gender equality. So I'm not shying away from those issues. I'm not shying away from 
some of the issues that sport has, and rugby league is one example of it. Um, but I just think that uh, I have seen the power of these programs in Papua New Guinea to actually get people talking about these issues. I've gone to events in Australia where, for example, one of my local clubs, the Macquarie Scorpions, proud um, birthplace of lots of NRL players, um, on the round against domestic violence, um, they do events to highlight raising awareness. We've got to do more of that. Sport is an avenue for that, but I'm not shying away from the antisocial elements that we have to deal with. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for the questions. Can I invite some questions for Amelia and David in particular as well, sir? Yeah, hi, I'm Jeff Richardson. I've played uh, the co at the highest level. I was also in uh, Papua New Guinea in 83, 4, 5 at the International High School as a teacher. I was chairman and president of the Schoolboy Rugby League and we ran carnivals and coaching courses and all that sort of stuff. Just looking, just quickly, I just thought about what if the Prime Minister changes and the next Prime Minister is not a rugby league man? Sorry, I'll leave that with you. Impossible uh, in PNG. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> and... Quickly, will the other sports want to get the same assistance? You know, the netball teams in Papua New Guinea want to get the Australian government to help them as well. Anyway, just going back to the school board and pathways. The pathways is a big one, David, and you spoke on it here. I sometimes think that some of the 18 and 19 year olds that come into the league should be playing club rugby league and working the things out for themselves. Instead of at 14 and 15 being told in a certain part of the field you do this and a certain part of the field you do that. Okay, that's just my beef. On the pathways, you know, do you see, uh, I'd see some more scholarships being given to the 15, 16 year old children. I'll say children now, not just rugby league players, but netballers and other sports, even marble players. To come to Australia and go to the school and, and to join clubs here. Could I see some 18, 19 year olds who have missed out on the Hunters being drafted into every NRL team in Australia to go through their pathways. Um, yeah, so there's a whole lot of development that needs to be done there. You know, um, just on schoolboy trips, Peter Sterling was in the New South Wales schoolboy side that toured Papua New Guinea in 1974. Uh, so that's been going on for quite a while. It, it has lapsed over the years. Um, the little screen that entertains some of the children in Australia and also some of the children in Papua New Guinea is taking kids away from their free play in the village and free play in our backyards. If you drive around Australia in the streets at 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, now you'll see a couple of junior sporting teams training, but you won't see kids kicking a football or throwing a cricket ball around in the street, which years ago used to happen. So th there's a whole development pathway which has got to be done. Look, in Papua New Guinea, some people here probably don't realise, but if you, there's a national competition up there with about six teams, I think, or eight teams. The Highlanders versus the Islanders years ago used to be a real origin thing. It was almost warfare, wasn't it, David? Um, but some of the people that play in the town competitions in Moresby and Lay, they go and play in village football in the off-season. So they play it nearly all year round. So there's a big avenue there. I just go back to funding as well, you know. Um, yeah, who, who's going to fund this? In the late 60s and early 70s, there was professional rugby league teams in Papua New Guinea that was paying as much money as any country team in Australia. And Australians who didn't get to go to Sydney to play went to Papua New Guinea to play for steamships and, and DCA. Uh, so whether that's going to build up again up there, uh, getting sponsorship money is a big thing. It'll take a lot of money. On tourism and also taking people up to play, to fly to Moresby is nearly as much as to fly to Paris. Paris or London. So the, the, the airfares will stop a lot of people in travel tourism. And I think our link with Papua New Guinea and Australia goes back to the early 40s in the Second World War. And if people got a hold of that, you'll see how important Papua New Guinea and Australia are to one another. And rugby league, yeah, I hope it does work and it comes through. Um, so the whole pathway thing has got to happen. Could Mr. any res responses from, from uh, Amelia or David on the pathways point? Um, and then we'll, we'll give the minister a chance yeah, to respond. I think Jeff, you just nailed it there. I think pathways, that's what, that's what I'm focused on. And I know Scotty from uh, PNG Hunters, you know, we've spoken about creating pathways for PNG because a lot of the challenges that come with you know, playing at the top level is in PNG is you're not 
being challenged to play essentially against men until you're 23, 24. So, you know, the earlier you can get that opportunity, you know, with the, with the right training, uh, the better it is for uh, the sport uh, itself. So, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a whole pack, uh, you know, the whole lot of things to be unpacked uh, in what you just said there. But, yeah, I think Pathways is a very important place to focus on uh, alongside this NRL bid. Emilia, any reflections from you? No, oh, I agree. I think that's where... Um it needs to happen is um, start, start them young and um, you don't want to wait till you know they're getting into like you know I use the boys for example into the hunters program to learn how to c catch and pass probably or get their footing right in defense like you want that second hand like you start from from young and when you're coming into the professional system or semi-professional system you already know the basic skills you're not starting from scratch and then you're well prepared for it to enter the professional arena and if I just add something about we need to be careful, and again, this is something for the NRL and the PNG consortium if they're successful to work out. But as a keen fan, I think people shouldn't automatically assume that every single player that plays for them, certainly in their initial years, will be of Papua New Guinean heritage. Like, it has to have a PNG identity. That is critical. It must be a team that the people of PNG own and have connection with. But not even the New Zealand Warriors or the Auckland Warriors at the time when they came in, not every player who started for them was a Kiwi. There was a sprinkling of experienced Australian uh, players who, who were part of that. It had a Kiwi identity. It was the New Zealand's team. And that's something that our people should be a bit pragmatic about. The critical thing is the pathways. The critical thing is that the culture and heritage and ownership is Papua New Guinea. And if there's a few, a sprinkling of experienced players from the NRL that have other heritage, might be other Pacifica players, that's a good thing. That mix is there. This is a PNG team, but with a, a broader cross section, which will help de risk it to some extent. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Kapui, and I have a small cultural awareness business for those that are interested in working or partnering um, with Papua New Guineans. Amelia, I have a question for you. Lovely to meet you in person. You said something that really struck. Um, struck a chord with me and that was you can't see what you can't be. For young women in PNG that want to play sport, is there a social mindset that we have to get over? Like are they immediately wanting to play sport or is it too patriarchal? They've got a place in society which doesn't allow them to play sport. How big do you feel is that gap to bridge to get them wanting to play sport in the first instance? Yeah, really nice to meet you and great question. Um, I think that gap is getting closer and closer. Um, Initially, you know, like growing up a female, you know, such a male dominated country, you know, you're brought up to be, you know, a stay at home mom, you know, be in the kitchen, cook food, all that. But now we see the generation coming through, like they're starting to have a voice. Um, and I think rugby league and sport in general gives them that voice as well. Um, you know, they're able to, um, like what I said before, you know, you can't be what you can't see. They can see players now that look like them, that um, physically look like them and they, um, you know, come from their villages as well, playing on TV. Um, I'll use Elsie as an example again, but, you know, a girl in the village watching that, they're like, oh, you know, she looks like me. She she, she can play and she can and play on TV. I want to be like that. So for them, they're starting to see it at a young age now and coming through. I think their mindset is shifting, but also I think it's more important for the males of the society, for their um, mindset to shift as well. Um, and I think it's it's slowly happening. We've got a long way to go, but we're, we're on the right path to, to, to get there. And um, yeah, I think rugby league is, is such a great vehicle to drive that change. Thank you. Deputy Governor, so please. It's, so it's, um, it, One sec. You, you are, yes, you are correct in saying that gap is closing. It's, uh, we've also got to bear in mind that back in the 80s and the 70s, like Port Moresby Rugby League or Papua Rugby League, there were women's competitions back then. Um, uh, and, and now it is like it, we, we just the discussion is in play. Uh, I, I know the hunters are doing it. I, I know uh, Digital Cup is doing it. They, there are talks um, uh, underway in preparing uh, women's mm -hmm. women's competition. So I think uh, we need to be aware of that that this is it, it's not something that hasn't been done or, or it, it's been done in the mm -hmm. past, but somehow we lost our way mm -hmm. and we're now getting back into it. So um, yeah, so I just mm -hmm. want to add on to that that that. that there, there are discussions and uh, our women's comp should be up and running very soon with some sponsors, correct? <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. 
Any other questions from the audience? Please, sir. Uh, hello, uh, Tara, I'm a, a Griffith student and, and PMG Student Association community member. Um, you touched on sort of the bid, if, if off that announcement and, and, and with the commissioner's comments of having a team based in Cairns. Um, first of all, David and Amelia, what's your view on that? And secondly, if the bid does gain momentum as we get closer to the license date, will there be a push by the Australian government to have the team based in PNG? Yeah, th um, well, my view on the team based, being based in Cairns, initially, I think it's a great idea. Uh, what Mr. Conroy touched on about getting players to uh, go represent PNG, I think that's going to be one of the main challenges. Uh, you know, signing a Adam Reynolds, um, getting him to Port Moresby, there's going to be some challenges there with that as well. And you know, I'm not saying it's going to be for everyone, but if it's in Cairns initially to kick things off, I, I think that's probably the best way to start it. And I know there's um, junior rugby league um, programs in, in Cairns to help support that team. Attracting players to sign to the team, it will be much easier to, you know, to create a solid foundation, solid uh, culture, because you're not, you're not going to have all Papua New Guineans just going and playing for that team. There's just no no pool of players. There's very minimal pool of players to choose from. And so Cairns makes perfect sense to me because a nice tropical place and, you know, not too cold up there. So I'm sure everyone want to sign it. <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd sign at Cairns over Sydney so, or Melbourne. So, um, in that, in that, from that perspective, it makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely support it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so too. I think, um, like David said, you know, if you're going to ask someone, and this is, again, from the female perspective, mm -hmm. but if you're going to ask, you know, an Isabel Kelly or Jess or just to come play for a PNG NRL team and say, hey, move to Port Moresby and play for us, you know, they're going to look at one, safety. Are they able to go for a run around the block at 6 o'clock in the night? That's when they finish work and they come home and that's when they go to train, like, Realistically speaking, um, that Cairns would definitely be a, a better way to go. And just like David said, you know, there's a very minimal pool of, of women to choose from as well um, to, to play in the NRLW. So starting off, um, I mean, Australia and having a combination of everything. And for also for like the staff as well, I think um, to, you know, have 50-50 or 60-40 or whatever it is, for, but for the Australian staff to come over and, and take the PNG staff under their wings and teach them and, and educate them as well and, and bring them through so that, you know, in the future, five, ten years down the line, we're able to stand on our own feet because we've we've got the resources backing us and we've got the education and now we can, you know, fly on our own kind of thing. Thank you. And we have time for... Okay, after that, we have time for one more question. <laughs> so, no, for, for someone that's yeah. in Port Moresby, I think, I think we need to be careful when, we, when we're saying that... Um, you know, they can't come and stay in Port Moresby. And, you know, we've got the Hunters staff there. Hmm. We've got expatriates that are living in Port Moresby. Um, you know, they brought their families in. So I think we need to reconsider that and just be careful at how it's sold. Because I think Port Moresby is getting better. Uh, it does have its, you know, challenges, but we're working through that. And uh, and if we're talking what the, you know, what the, what the federal government is thinking, it's, I, I think, you know, I think the base has to be Port Moresby. We, we've got to sell it as as the destination, as as well as you know, as, as well as the, the identity of this team. So, you know, I mean, we, we, we can have this debate after after this is finished. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll probably just jump in there as well. I'll probably, I'll, I probably didn't sound that right, but I think just initially to get like you know strong players at a club to start uh, start the club. I don't know if Dolphins had that challenge. Because that perception we need to change as well. And I've always been asked, you know, is, is Port Moresby safe? You know, and the feedback's been, you know, well, I've spoken to my friends, they stay in the resorts. And I said, well, your friends, in, your friends need to get out of the resort and go walk the streets of Port Moresby. Huge expat community that lives in PNG. They live, you know, they live like life's just normal. Yeah, there's, there's places that you need to avoid, uh, you know. But people have been there for a very long time. And I know I spoke to Tim about that. Recently, I've spoken to many people. You know, I've, I've lived there myself. I go back there myself. I walk the streets. Safety is the number one concern. But I guess from my perspective, you know, talking about getting players to Port Moresby, the challenges for that Redcliffe Dolphins face, I think Port Moresby will face much bigger challenges than that. So it wasn't necessarily about uh, safety. 
uh, because I, I do get upset when I, I hear that safety perception as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not denying it. it; it does exist. But people who go stay in the hotels, come back and give their feedback, they need to get out and um, walk the streets of Port Moresby. They'll they'll, they'll find a much different experience uh, if they do. Who is the brave soul I was willing to ask the last question? Something you've been burning to, but too afraid. Now is your chance. It's a <laughs> well, I, I, well uh, we've got a hunter's representative here. I see them as complementing each other. Like, again, um, well, I, again, this is not a formal government decision. I should preface that. Uh, I'm not here to sign a check in perpetuity, but those pathways for me are both the 14 year olds playing in Moresby in the Highland in Lay, coming through centres of excellence into the PNG team. But um, all the NRL sides also have feeder teams all over the place. Like Newtown Jets have been bloody partnered with five different. NRL clubs like the PNG Hunters ha have been a success story. Them and the Fijian uh, Silk Tails in the Ron Massey Cup in New South Wales have been great for Pacific Rugby League, and we want to continue that. And I want the sort of I want the seventeen year old Papua New Guinean kid blooded in in the Hunters, and also quite frankly, I want people who are late bloomers to come through the system. So. The, the state-based competitions are really important and I, I wouldn't want us to do anything at an NRL level that means that we, we lose the success that is the Hunters. And I think that's something we should make very clear. They all complement each other. Thank you, Minister. Okay, folks, that's all. Uh, that's the time that we have allocated for this. I do invite you to uh, continue the discussion with those sandwiches that I mentioned earlier, I made some big promises. Now I can't see through that wall, but I really hope they're there. <laughs> um, before we do that, can you please uh, give a round of applause for our panelists today? <clears throat> Amelia Cook, David Mead, Minister Pat Conroy, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has been a Lowy Institute OzPNG Network event, um, and thank you all for joining us. If you're watching this online, um, you'll know this because you're watching it, but for those of us here today, this has been recorded and will be published online. That's something to think about. Um, but thank you all, and please bear in mind the minister uh, has a plane to catch, so um, please, <laughs> please be kind as you try to buttonhole him on the way out the door. Um, thank you all.